my name is David Bryant. I'm the director of the Rancho Mirage Public Library. Normally we do inside the Rancho Mirage Public Library as a series of interviews. Today we have something a little bit different, a great idea from our Mayor Iris Smartrich, and I think at this point I'm going to be the subject of the interview and Iris will be the interviewer, but we're going to have a conversation. And we're here in my home in Rancho Mirage and you'll see some odd things here. We'll be talking about that too. Iris, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Needless to say, I've been waiting a long time to do this interview and I think you are the perfect subject for our residents of Rancho Mirage as well as our Coachella Valley. Uh, you came from New England area and you certainly brought a panache, a sophistication to our library and I think it would really be great for all of our viewers to know the real David Bryant, what makes his world spin, and all the things that give him pleasure and how he projects his artistic talent. Uh, most people don't know how artistic you are, and you saw, call it a, a little bit of um, strangeness, but most of us think of it as an artistic value that most of us do not possess. So I want you to tell us all about David, all the artistic things in your life, all the fun things you do, and some of the places you've been. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Iris. What a, what a lead in. I, uh, I came to librarianship because I'm interested in everything, and libraries contain everything. If you have an interest, the library should be the first stop. Uh, that's what brought me to it. And the world of libraries that I grew up with in suburban New Jersey, six miles west of Times Square, was one where if I walked in the library, they knew it was trouble, the, the little old ladies, frankly, that ran it, because I wanted to go into the adult area and read books about FDR, the New Deal, World War II, the Great Depression. That was my great interest. <clears throat> Early 20th century presidential politics. Well, they said, go down to the children's room. You're a kid. And when they weren't shushing, so I thought, and I think I was probably eight or nine when my mother went in and really uh, made quite a stink about it and uh, got me an adult card so I could read more. And <clears throat> that's the library side. It's a profession that's 85% female, so I'm kind of a, in the 15% minority and uh, love my job, love our city, and love our library. But today, I guess we're going to talk more about me. I came from... Um, Connecticut, where I ran the New Canaan Public Library. A, uh, it's a very affluent town near Greenwich. That area is called the Gold Coast of Connecticut for a good reason, because there's a lot of hedge funds there, a lot of Wall Street bankers uh, live there. It's a very moneyed place. And <clears throat> I don't say that with any snobbishness. I say that because I want my libraries to succeed. So that library succeeded mightily because we were well-funded and we had a great tax base. We had a supportive city government, but we were an independent private library, which was fun as well because we could kind of do whatever we gosh darn pleased, which wasn't anything too rebellious, but we, we had a good time. And we had Walter Cronkite as a speaker. Brian Williams set up much of what we did. I still consider Brian a friend, but things were a little rough for Brian. <clears throat> they are. In my opinion, Brian should take on the John Stewart role and do the Comedy Central news at night. I'm absolutely serious about that. And I'm sending him a little note to that effect, <clears throat> which probably, I don't think it's insulting. I think it's a good solution for him. Anyway, um, my house purchased in 2008. It's classic mid century, post and beam construction. Interesting to me that I was able to find this house and Post and Beam led me to it because the realtor that I used, um, I told her exactly what I was looking for. Very classically mid-century, probably built between 56 and about 1970. This was built 1964. I left a house in Connecticut that was built in 1840 that was the same construction as this house, but it couldn't be any more different. Seven foot ceilings, wide board floors, classic windows with the mullions and they were called 12 over 12 which is 12 little panes of glass over 12 on the bottom classic new england farmhouse so to come to a classic mid-century meant a lot to me because that's what this desert looks like to me that's what drew me here from the uh, original uh, charlie farrell's racket club which was broadcast 
to our New Jersey house in the mid, early 1950s to mid 1950s. And I was five years old when I decided I wanted to live in Palm Springs and then decided Rancho Mirage would be better. So it only took 60 years to get here, but uh, well, I was we, complaining. We have, been waiting. <laughs> we have been waiting for you for yes. all these years. Well, the welcome map was put out and you and your husband, Tom, were, were my best friends here early on. So I appreciate that more than I can ever say. Yeah. And looking around here, <clears throat> as our camera, uh, Dustin A.O., our terrific AV guy at the library is taping this, just to go through some of the paintings, the uh, painting of the young woman uh, dashing off to school, I like as much for the story as for the colors and for, for everything else. To me, there's a wonderful story there of a beautiful young woman who's actually a gallery director in real life, as we say. She's in lower Manhattan, and <clears throat> she's, her little girl is clutching her because it's the little girl's first day of school, and we all remember that. So five years old, and the big brother, who's seven, is behind, but he's only in a silhouette. And even though he's the big brother in the big shot, because he has two years of school under his belt, he's still trying to catch up to mom. And I think it's just a beautiful story. And it's, it's sophisticated New York, her clothing is sophisticated, the look is sophisticated, but it's a, it's a mother. It's a mother and her kids in a great environment. So I just love that painting. And it was done uh, by a gentleman named Bijan who comes from Desert Hot Springs from a photograph that I provided to him. These are two Kennedy photos <clears throat> replicated in uh, photorealist painting style. This was the first one Bijan did for me. This is 1949 in uh, then House member John Fitzgerald Kennedy's office with his beautiful young wife, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, by his side, dutifully probably writing notes to constituents as the guests. And a stage photo, obviously. And then I think Bijan <clears throat> got better doing this one. This is in the, um, after the Democratic Convention, uh, still during the convention, August of 1960. JFK, many, many ballots. Those are the days when watching those conventions was like watching the Super Bowl. It was competitive, many ballots. <clears throat> Madam, Chairman, Madam Chairman, the great people of Mississippi vote 38 votes for, et cetera. So in that era. And this is the day after JFK won the nomination. He's with his brother, Bobby, and LBJ is here. But when you look at the dynamic of this photo, you realize that LBJ is ruling the roost here. This is a big man, big ego, a lot of power, and he's looking at JFK and his brother, he doesn't even acknowledge Bobby Kennedy, as if you little boys from Massachusetts, I'm the big boy from Texas. And I think that is captured perfectly in that painting, which was, again, a photo. You'll see also here some robots to my left. <clears throat> I make these out of uh, automobile parts. The one on the right is a what's called a throttle body from the fuel injection of a Nissan Pathfinder pickup truck. And the one in the middle is a Mercedes voltage regulator. And I add the other parts to them and turn them into robots. And then the one on the uh, immediately to my left is uh, a speedometer, we think from a Plymouth, <clears throat> circa 1956 or so. Uh, I added the eyeballs on top, the arms are vent window cranks from a 59 Chevy, and the uh, uprights are steel material that I'm able to get access to. <clears throat> and then in the foreground, we have a couple of uh, other items. The tall striped man I did not make, <clears throat> but I love, and bought it up in the high desert, uh, made by an artist, folk artist up there, and one of my latest robots is here as well. This. Uh, robot and it's funny to say what the legs are made of on that the smaller robot with the camera head they actually are from crutches that's a little bit macabre i suppose because we look at crutches as a defeat but i looked at them as parts for, for what i do so when i was able to find them in, in a junk shop i grabbed a pair and uh, cut them up and made legs out of them and then you have these fish that are uh, well, their, their uh, bark is worse than their bite. <clears throat> They've been there for months and nobody has been bitten or hurt by them. 
So, and to your right, Iris, is one of the cars that I made. I love cars. <clears throat> my first love, really, besides my kids, are probably cars. And this I made about five years ago. And it's made from a simple piece of two by four scrap and then some pine fenders and uh, very primitive materials. But it's all about the design for me. And I know that you speak of uh, a, a casual tone on how easily it is for you to make these. Uh, however, needless to say, anyone who's tried any of these arts and crafts type projects know that these are not easy to make. It takes a lot of love, a lot of effort, a lot of hard work. And I know we're going to go out in your garage or your workshop, as you call it, and as we would call it, because it, that in itself is a masterpiece. It is a pleasure to see all the items that you have collected where other people feel that they're not needed anymore. <laughs> Meaning and junk or garbage? Whatever, you know, <laughs> they can call it their junk or garbage, but you call it uh, a new artistic piece that's going to be applied to a new work of art for you. And you have the eye that is very discerning, and as people would throw things away, you would collect them and make them beautiful. So well, it, is a, it is a talent that thank very you. few people have, and we look forward to uh, seeing some of your uh, things in progress. We'll continue the tour out there. Okay, and we can also continue the tour going out to your backyard because there's three of your newest pieces. And I know that you have such a love for these things, and, and some of the galleries have wanted you to start, uh, you know, kind of to departing with some of these, and I know it tugs at your heart to think about that. They're my babies. They are your babies, <laughs> and rightfully so. But it's something that, you know, someday when you decide to, you know, give a little bit away and, and uh, let the rest of the world enjoy them, <laughs> people will be thrilled. So why don't we adjourn to the other area and we can pick up out there. Great. Okay, well here we are outside in David's lovely backyard and with his newest uh, works of art and maybe you can describe a little bit and while you're describing what these all consist of and how you obtained the materials, maybe you can talk a little bit about your beautiful blue uh, duck's head on a, on a great body and how you acquired it and um, what it cost. Okay, we'll reveal all the secrets here, Iris, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, as our mayor said, uh, three new pieces, uh, and these came about, they're actually barges. Now, <clears throat> by that I mean they're, they're primitive boats. The idea was not original, sadly. I always admit when I appropriate, and I certainly did in this case, what the cargo is is totally mine. But the concept of this boat, primitive boat, came from the Museum of Natural History in the city of Los Angeles. It's a remarkable museum, and with your grandchildren, Iris, you, this is a must-see. They have a huge folk art exhibit on right now. The piece that grabbed my attention was maybe the most primitive of all. It was a log that had been flattened on top, <clears throat> another slab of wood placed upon it, and four very primitive carved figures on it. And the minute I saw it, I said, boom, I'm off and running. And my concept was to use different kinds of, rather than people, I don't really, I don't do people. I do robots, fish, uh, these creatures with legs, which I call Darwin, the first primitive fish that came ashore with legs on it. So this first one is the first I did, and the title of it is Bringing Home a New Friend from a Neighboring Island. The concept here is that this gentleman, who is uh, anthropomorphic with a man's body, but also has a duck's head, with a little bit of a nice feathering approach here, <clears throat> went to the neighboring island and brought a new friend home. I mean, that's pretty much, it lives up to its title. And I use as much color as I can, I saturate. We all know Roy G. Bibb, red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, and violet. Well, I use Roy G. Bibb everywhere. I'll use all the color I can get in pieces like this. This is the latest one, <clears throat> and this uh, is a fish, again, back to the Darwin model, where a fish comes ashore, only his legs are a bit taller. Uh, Looks like he could play in the NBA at this height. And metal, paint galore, really almost uh, almost as if you'd find this in a Mexican village, I think that's part of my goal too, is I love that saturated color. This is a paper mache deer, which had this head on it when I bought it for 50 cents at a junk shop. And this 
head I inherited from my father who made decoys. So <clears throat> as soon as I got home, I took the deer's head off for that piece and epoxied this duck head on and made a metal, uh, again, the, I like sort of the flaming effect of the uh, <clears throat> headdress. And then this, I really <laughs> like this. No, it's not Bullwinkle. But the idea here is, we all know about Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. Well, this is the young man in the sea. This creature has been out in the ocean for a long time and finally is bringing home his catch. And this is his catch, this incredibly bright, wildly colored third world fish. So these are the three latest. And as I said to our mayor, I really don't want to sell these. I love these. I have a couple of galleries representing me, one in the state of Maine and one here in California. They're bugging me for these, and I really, <clears throat> I'd rather not sell these. I'll make them something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make them a little something else. So these are the latest, and uh, <clears throat> again, visiting museums. If you're at all into art and interested, that keeps the flame alive, and it's uh, the best place to appropriate ideas. Well, let's move the flame into your workshop and give okay. everyone a bird's eye view of uh, how you make all these beauties. David, as we're walking through the house again onto the, your workshop, we can't help notice this wonderful piece. Maybe you could tell us a little about this. This, another Bijan from Desert Hot Springs, <clears throat> very good uh, photorealist uh, painter. I provided him with a photo <clears throat> that was a staged photo from the mid 50s to sell a house in Palm Springs. And we stage houses now, obviously, so we staged houses 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And this is a classic mid-century modern house. And what caught my eye was this material is such a perfect match for these walls. It's as if the painting almost emerges from the walls in this house. And I love this woman's expression. She's engaged in the fact that she's with other people. These two are having a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And I think that's a cigarette. I know that's a cigarette, so of the era. And these folks are clearly models. They're not too involved, but they're, uh, <clears throat> they're paid there to fill out the uh, scene. And this is a TV, circa 1956. So I just, I love the time period. I like the decorating. And the people are great. So I think there's a story in this, but uh, he did a great job. It took him three months to paint this, this uh, painting, oil on canvas. And I can't resist showing <clears throat> my latest car, which uh, is, I think, the best I've ever done, made of redwood, pine, and a lot of time, and a lot of paint. There's probably 12 to 14 coats of paint on this, but hand sanded in between each coat. So I just love the lipstick red, love the design, and it's classic Southern California chop top um, car of the late 40s, uh, customized probably in North Hollywood, which was the epicenter of car customizing in that era. And this is my tribute to that whole era and that whole uh, genre of cars. And the fact that you did not include the back tires. Yeah, and well, it's, it just sits so low that why, have, why even bother? Why bother? Why clutter it? It's a, exactly. It's sleek and beautiful. It's very sleek. And I love the lipstick red. Okay, now on to the workshop. Well, here we are in this magnificent workshop uh, with all your robots in the back here, your hanging bicycles over here, which I know are not part of the works of art, but certainly fit in perfectly. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different elements that are included here, and I know that uh, Dustin will kind of pan around when he has an opportunity to really see what's going on. You even have your earthquake preparedness And sticks. I painted those blue just for you, Iris. Yes, and they are in closing your cabinets here so we know that nothing will go in flying out uh, at an inopportune moment. But there's someone we need to talk about and that is a gentleman named Del Baxter. Del Baxter, <clears throat> I think we all need um, an alter ego. We need, well, what I've developed and why I think I should impose this on other people is absurd, but I recommend that everybody have a Dell Baxter in their life. If I were not this David Bryant, I would be Dell Baxter. Dell Baxter would be lazy, he'd live at the Salton Sea in a trailer, he would drink Sanka, and he would carve scrap wood. And that's about, that would be the lifestyle. 
So I'm working on a book about Dell Baxter with my good friend Ron Sharrow, whom you know very well. Ron is our city's um, uh, speaker series chair this year, right. commission, and a good friend. And Ron and I will eventually put this book together. And it's the life of Dell Baxter. And it's a failed life. Everything he touches fails. Everything he does is a disaster. So <clears throat> I apply the name Dell Baxter to much of the art that I make. That way, if it isn't very good, I can blame somebody else. And the Dell Baxter concept really got going when I bought this plate at a garage sale in Maine a couple of summers ago. And God bless our camper. I found it so charmingly, um, it's, it's Americana of the, of the greatest sort. Of course, it's made in China, but <clears throat> so be it. And I turned that into the book cover, which will be the cover of the book, which is entitled God Bless My Camper by Dell Baxter. And Del Baxter is the um, is the man in this in this cover, and that's his camper, all stolen from the uh, from the little plate that I bought at the garage sale. But I know it sounds absurd, but Del Baxter is an important guy, certainly important in my life. So this book will be coming out in a year or so. Well, we know you have a tremendous love for the salt sea, and you go out there Absolutely. frequently. And I see a classic piece right in the middle here of. Uh, Silver, uh, what is it called? Well, sort of an Airstream trailer. Well, thank you for mentioning the Salton Sea. I do drive down there a lot. And in fact, the library is taking a uh, group in a 55-seat in a coach. Absolutely, down and there we're going to. And we're going to have a good time, I promise. Strange, but a good time. So <clears throat> my vision of the Salton Sea is that anything is possible there. So, of course, one of these serpents, you know, I do these... Uh, terrifyingly benign uh, sea creatures. So he's coming out of the Salton Sea, not surprising, anything could be in there. And this is not quite an airstream, but similar, and nice awnings, I must say. And I made this out of a material called MDF, and uh, just uh, absolutely nothing more advanced than sheet metal that I buy at uh, Home Depot. And this came out of PVC pipe, and the title of this piece is errant, E-R-R-A-N-T, meaning misfired, Soviet missile lands on trailer at the Salton Sea. It's a complicated title, but it's a complicated piece. So some poor soul appears to be in here and trying to get out. The door is ajar. There's all kinds of a pretty mucky ooze coming out of it. But that's what happens down at the Salton Sea. You never know. There are surprises galore. And then speaking of missiles, I got into missiles briefly, but this was the only rock that I made. But I hope to get back to that someday. This is a coupe version of the convertible that we saw in the living room. This piece with robots in a canoe is entitled Native American Robots. And it's a little play on words, but uh, having grown up on the East Coast and our tribe was the Yantico Indians of the Mohawk Nation, um, I've always been interested in Native Americans. I think we all have and have a great respect for their culture and their history. And I think I've played around with it a little bit, but lovingly, by having robots in a canoe. A couple more robots in a rowboat here. The antique camera collection grows all the time. I have these drawers down, doors down below are loaded with cameras. And <clears throat> I buy them whenever I can. They're becoming very trendy, so prices are up. But these will ultimately all end up as robot heads at some point. They just seem to me to be perfect as the head of a robot. The old projector will be disassembled and various parts here will become a robot. And over here we have a book cover of a book simply entitled Robot by Dell Baxter. Here we have a target for who knows why. Here we have a book cover called Fish by Dell Baxter. This is a friend of mine, Don Cracky, who is now an assisted living, but a really great artist. And that's a piece that I was able to acquire from his gallery. And Salton Sea uh, Trailer Park is right here with again the sea serpent and another trailer. And some of this uh, great old green copper, East Coast came off a shed. This is called hunting season with what looked like antlers. Now here's a California flag for you. Pocatillo, corks, scrap plywood. And this is called my uh, immigration flag. 
because <clears throat> many of our immigrants come here for a better life and a job. So there's a dollar epoxied on here, dollar coin, and the colors represent the, the nations of, uh, of uh, Latin America, the exciting colors that uh, folk artists there use. So that was the flag period. Every Geppetto, every toy maker, every artist, scrap wood or whatever, needs a bandsaw. Bandsaw gives complete uh, liberation to what's hidden inside, waiting to be revealed from a simple piece of wood. And this bandsaw made every car that is on this uh, surface. <clears throat> I had the good fortune to be featured in a magazine, uh, June of 2013, Hot Rod Magazine, which is the the oldest, most successful magazine in the hot rodding and custom car world, and they gave me a nice two-page spread. And all of these cars are right here today. And just to go through them very quickly, anything from, again, 1940s fat fendered convertibles to all customized to a late 50s car with a color that I think, and a chop top, you see how low the top is, big wheels. These cars were very popular in the... Uh, I'd say 56 to 62 era of car customizing. Hot rods always have a place. This is a 1932 Ford Coupe, very much simplified. Little Deuce Coupe, as the song goes. This is my version of a Corvette Stingray, made out of balsa and medium density fiberboard. And as you can see, walking along here, and where does the inspiration come from? Well, in this case, from a magazine photo that I saw of this very much customized Buick Riviera, and I interpreted it my own way, and I think I nailed the color pretty well. So I appropriate endlessly. Again, a convertible, a stove part from the 1940s turned into an automobile showroom for this silver coupe. <clears throat> this is one of my favorites. This is based on George Sam Barris, who is the brother of George Barris in North Hollywood. Um, did an incredible uh, Mercury in, uh, it was a 51 Mercury Coupe customized, and this is my interpretation of it, very loose interpretation. This car, which I photographed last year at the Dr. George car show in Indian Wells, resides somewhere in Rancho Mirage, and I'd love to meet the owner and see it. Um, it's beautiful, it's 54 Lincoln, and the next car I make will be derivative of this, including the yellow color. This is a car for the Bonneville Salt Flats, probably a 300 mile an hour streamliner. Very primitive, but I think I captured it as folk art with the big fender skirts, small cockpit. Without paint, a little bit of a different look. And so on. Color is equally important here as it is in any of the other folk art. This is a very famous streamliner built in 1948 in Southern California in a backyard um, <clears throat> behind a garage and then hauled to Bonneville and ran at 150, 160 miles an hour. And I made this tribute model to it. You see the motel signs here. You see some of the photographs. This is our tram station, which is now an information station in uh, information center in Palm Springs, at the bottom of the tram. Uh, salt and sea photos, trailers in various stages of destruction. So it all sort of comes together, and it comes together in this workshop, which is the home of Del Baxter, who is who I would be were I not gainfully employed and energetic. <laughs> Well, fortunately, you are gainfully employed and energetic, and you have amassed a collection of artistic pieces that would rival any fine collector's selection. So we're thrilled that you have taken us on a tour. We're thrilled that you are involved with all these projects, and we're delighted that you are going to share them with us on our Rancho Mirage television, and everyone else can enjoy the work you've done. Thank you, Iris. Thanks for the opportunity to show my life.